Well, hello everyone. Um, today we're talking about empirical and molecular formulas. Um, you already know that a chemical formula um, of a compound represents the relative numbers of the various types of atoms present. For example, if we have CO2, we know that this 2 uh, represents the number of oxygen atoms present in this compound. Um, an empirical formula versus a molecular formula, um, those are uh, important to understand the difference between them. Um, an empirical formula is the simplest formula. It's the very smallest whole number ratio of the atoms present. And now this might not make sense to you yet, but it will. Um, a molecular formula, in contrast, is the actual formula for a compound. So, an example. Let's look at glucose right here. This is the molecular formula for glucose. When we see a glucose molecule, it has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens, and they are all uh, bonded in a very specific way. We can reduce that molecular formula to an empirical formula the very simplest formula, um, simply by dividing the number of each atom by its greatest common factor, which is 6. If you look at this, uh, we can see 6, 12, and 6. We know 6 will divide into each of those. It's the greatest common factor that will go into each of those. And when we do that, we reduce that molecular formula to the empirical formula of CH2O because 6 divided by 6 is just 1, gives us 1 carbon. 12 divided by 6 is 2, and 6 divided by 6 is 1. So we would just re simply reduce that to its empirical formula. We can also represent uh, the molecular formula like this, CH2O, in parentheses, and we have 6 of them. So that's another way to think about that. So now you try this. Um, if given the molecular formula, can you find the empirical formula based on our example, what we just did? So what's the empirical formula for hydrogen peroxide? First write the molecular formula and then see if you can tell me what the empirical formula is. Now if you'll recall, um, I didn't point this out, but on, on the last frame, uh, the empirical formula and the molecular formula can be identical. So you may come across a situation where they are indeed the same. So pause the video, see if you can do those, and then go to the next page um, to check your answers. So now here are our answers. Let's look at hydrogen peroxide. First, we need to remember how to write hydrogen peroxide. That was on the test, so hopefully um, you can remember or uh, learn from your mistakes with H2O2. Remember the peroxide here. Um, if we write the molecular formula, and we, we write it out, it's H2O2. But if we want to write the empirical formula, we reduce that to simply HO. Carbon tetrachloride. Then remember, that's a type 3 compound in our nomenclature unit. From our nomenclature unit, it's at one carbon and four chlor chloride ions. And carbon tetrachloride has the same molecular formula as it does empirical formula. Butane, C4H10. Uh, that has a different empirical formula. When we reduce that, we can divide both of these numbers by 2, and we can get a C2H5 for empirical formula. So now that you know how to write the empirical formula when given the molecular formula, let's try to um, challenge ourselves with another objective here. If we are given the mass of each of the individual elements, can we find the empirical formula? It's a little bit more difficult. And we have some just basic fundamental steps here that we're going to follow. Um, and I'll read through the steps, but I think it will be a little bit more clear in the next frame when we actually do the example together. First, we have to actually find the mass of each element in grams and then determine the number of moles of each type of atom. After that, we can then divide the number of moles of each element by the smallest number of moles to convert that smallest number to 1. And we can multiply the numbers uh, as needed in order to obtain whole numbers in our formula. So let's do a, a practice together. 
So here's our example. Let's say the reaction of 4.151 grams of aluminum and 3.692 grams of oxygen, um, that reaction forms a compound with what empirical formula? Um, here I rewrote our steps so we can refer to those, but let's go ahead and start with step one. Find the mass. Well, we already know the mass. 4.151 grams aluminum, 3.692 grams of oxygen. So, step number two, determine the number of moles of each type of atom. All right, let's do that. Convert the grams to moles. So, remember how to do that. We have grams of aluminum times our conversion factor here. And we have um, grams of aluminum cancel out right there, and we get our number of moles, 0 0.1539 moles of aluminum atoms. And when we convert to moles with oxygen, we start with the grams of oxygen, 3.692 grams. Um, and with our conversion factor, we have grams of oxygen canceling out. Um, remember, we have 16.00 grams of oxygen per one mole. Um, we get that those number that number right there from the periodic table, if you'll recall, and we get our number of moles of oxygen atoms when we do the math. So number three, what do we do next? Now we have our moles of oxygen. What do we do with that? Well, we divide the smallest number of moles of each element um, by we divide the number of moles of each element by the smallest number. So which of these number of moles? is the smallest number, this one. <laughs> uh, that's pretty easy. And so we take each of these numbers and we divide them by the smallest number, which is 0.1539. I did that right there. So I'm going to put 0.1539 on the bottom. And I'll take the number of moles and put that on the numerator for each of my terms. And I will end up with 1.000 moles of aluminum. and 1.500 moles oxygen atoms. So I'm getting a little closer to the answer. I will have one more step because 1.5 is not a number that we are going to write in our uh, formula, in our empirical formula. Uh, we want whole numbers. So how do we get whole numbers? We multiply the numbers that we just calculated in step three by the smallest integer that will convert all of those to whole numbers. That will be a two. If I simply multiply this by 2, I will end up with a 3, correct? And if I multiply this by a 2, I end up with a 2. So we end up with 2 moles of aluminum, 3 moles of oxygen. And our empirical formula is right here. Aluminum, 2. Oxygen, 3. And that's our empirical formula. Now you try. Let's give you a 1.500 gram sample of a compound. It only contains carbon and hydrogen. And we know that the amount of carbon in it, we are told, is 1.198 grams. Now you determine the empirical formula for this compound. One little hint, if you would like it. When you find the mass in the beginning, you already know the mass of the carbon, but when you're going to find the mass of the hydrogen, you will need to subtract. Do a little subtracting in order to find that. So good luck, and let's see if you get the right answer. So here is our answer. This is the problem just restated. We're going to find the mass of each element in grams, um, and in order to do that, we take 1.500 grams of our entire sample. And we're going to subtract the grams of carbon. That leaves us with the remaining mass uh, being attributed to hydrogen right there. So we know the mass of each element now. We're going to convert the mass into moles. So remember, we start with grams of carbon, multiply by our, our uh, uh, molar mass conversion unit here. 12.01 grams of carbon to one mole is equal to one mole of carbon. And arrange those so that the grams of carbon cancel out and we get moles of carbon atoms. And we do the same thing for hydrogen. We get moles of hydrogen atoms right here. Now, the third step, we divide both of those numbers by the smallest number of moles, which happens to be this one, 0 0.09975. So I'll take each of these numbers, write them down right here, and divide each of them by the smaller 
of those numbers, which is 0 0.09975. That ends up giving me 1.000 moles of carbon and 3.004 moles of hydrogen. If you'll, if you'll notice, I'm trying to carry the correct numbers of significant figures through all of these. Um, we are limited by four sig figs in each of these um, digits right here. So I use four sig figs in my answer. Obviously, we will not use significant figures in the empirical formula. Um, that will be, uh, we will view that as an exact number. So we actually have our numbers that we need here. Um, we don't need, we have whole numbers, essentially. Um, so we are going to use uh, the 3 and the 1 as our whole numbers to write the empirical formula, which is CH3. So now that we know how to find the empirical formula from the molecular formula and we know how to find the empirical formula if we're given the number of grams of each of the uh, types of atoms, uh, let's see if we could challenge ourselves with another objective. Can we find the empirical formula if we are given the percent composition of a compound? Now here is a fun example. We're going to look at this. Um, and it's a fun little trick that we can do um, in order to determine basically the grams of each of the elements um, from the empirical formula. So here we're given a sample, and it has 66.75% copper, 10.84% phosphorus, and 22.41% oxygen. We're supposed to find the empirical formula for this compound. We're going to follow the exact same steps that we did before, uh, we just need to figure out how we're going to get the grams initially for each of the elements. And this, this little trick is, is a really easy one. Just remember, let's pretend that our sample is 100 grams. If we have a 100 gram sample, we will simply have 66.75 grams of copper, right? We will have 10.84 grams of phosphorus and 22.41 grams of oxygen. Makes it really simple. So in our 100 hypothetical gram sample, we're going to now convert these to moles. And we do that uh, simply as we did before, using the conversion unit uh, of the molar mass to find out the number of moles of copper, phosphorus, and oxygen. Then we'll divide all of these numbers by the smallest number of moles, which is 0 0.3500. That's the smallest number. Um, the results are 3, 1, and 4, respectively, for copper, phosphorus, and oxygen when we do that. And now we don't need to do step 4 because we have whole numbers. So our empirical formula will be copper, 3 of those. So we'll write copper with the subscript 3. Phosphorus, there's only one of those, so we simply write the P for phosphorus. And oxygen, four of those, so we'll write a subscript 4. And here is our empirical formula. So just remember, we follow the same steps as we did uh, when converting uh, or when, when calculating uh, uh, the empirical formula from the mass of each element. Only we need to figure out what the mass of each element would be given these percentages. And we can do that by simply setting this whole sample to a 100 gram sample. So here is our final challenge uh, when dealing with empirical and molecular formulas. It's our last objective. Can we find the molecular formula if we're given the compound's empirical formula and molar mass? And we should be able to do that pretty easily because uh, we know, remember, that the molecular formula is the formula, the chemical formula, that the compound exists. Uh, that's how it exists. That's how it uh, go, goes around normally. The empirical formula is just the reduced version, okay, of reducing the proportions of the different elements into the simplest form. So if we're given... Um, the empirical formula and the molar mass, we should be able to find its molecular formula. How does this compound look normally? So here's an example. We are told that a compound has an empirical formula of P2O5 and a molar mass of 283.88 grams. 
what's its molecular formula? So in order to do this, we are going to first compare the empirical formula mass to the molar mass. And we'll do that in this way. We know phosphorus in our empirical formula. There are two moles of it. Oxygen, right there. There are five moles of it. So we're going to take two moles of the phosphorus. We're going to write this out mathematically. Two times its uh, molar mass right here, 30.97 grams. And we get that from the periodic table. It gives us this many grams. How about oxygen? five moles of that, and we have 16.00 uh, grams per mole. That gives us 80.00 grams of the oxygen in this empirical formula. So we know that the mass of one mole of P2O5 will be this when we add these together. Now, if you'll recall from our definition of a molecular formula, remember when we looked at glucose in the first frame, we could reduce the molecular formula into the empirical formula, and we could write it as the empirical formula times some number n. It happened to be a 6 in that case. So we're going to remember that um, the empirical formula uh, multiplied by some number will be giving us the molecular formula. So in order to do that, let's go ahead and substitute what we know into this equation. We know the, the uh, empirical formula mass, we just calculated it, is 141.94 grams times some number n, right? Our molecular formula was right up here, um, the molar mass, 283.88 grams. So. Right there, we can write that down. And I simply flipped these two around and rewrote them right here. Uh, and if I solve for n, divide both sides by 141.94, I get n equals 2. So we can simply substitute that into our definition right here. <laughs> we have our empirical formula, P2O5, correct? And we can substitute that in. Uh, for, for n, substitute 2 into there. And that gives us two of these. That's going to be our molecular formula. And when we multiply that out, we get two times two. That would be four. There are four phosphorus. Two times five gives us ten. It would be ten oxygens. And we get uh, tetraphosphorus uh, deck oxide. So that's kind of a uh, long... Um, long molecular formula, but that's what that one is. Now that you know how to do that, if you have some ideas for coming up with advanced proficiency, go ahead and look into creating a more complex problem. Um, you can look at industry examples and uh, go ahead and apply some of these rules to some examples that you can find. If you have another favorite thing, there's chemistry all around us. Cooking, maybe you like cooking, maybe you like um, I don't know, manufacturing uh, uh, different products, and you can look at some of these ideas and make up your own problem that's more complex and solve it, and I'll see you in class.